please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Michelle Mello. Thanks very much for coming out, especially in such a busy holiday season. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight and to share some of the very important work that the National Academies have been doing um, on a topic that touches us all, prescription drug prices. Um, so I want to explain tonight why I think that of all the difficult problems we have in health policy, this one is the worst. It's harder than figuring out how to get everybody health insurance. It's harder than addressing health disparities. It's harder than improving the quality of care because it has all of the features and pathologies of our healthcare system that make those problems difficult, plus a whole lot more. And I want to spend some time tonight giving you a tour through some of the dysfunctions in our system of delivering prescription drugs, as well as some of the prescriptions that the National Academies Committee, on which I was proud to serve in 2017, had for addressing some of these problems. I want to begin with a story about getting an unremarkable drug to a child. This is my son, Austin. He is one of the 4% of Americans who has a food allergy. He's allergic to peanuts. And he is allergic enough that we have to carry epinephrine with us wherever we go. For years, we've relied on the product um, from Mylan Pharmaceuticals, the EpiPen Junior, which is indisputably a fantastic product. This auto-injector delivers a dose of epinephrine in 10 seconds. It's virtually foolproof, and it's small enough to fit in your purse. But in 2016, the company that makes it, Mylan, came under public scrutiny because the price of this product, which contains about $2 worth of drug, had gradually crept up from about $100 for a two-pack of injectors in 2007 to $600 or $700 by 2016. And the company really no, offered no substantive justification for the price hikes, even when hauled before a House Oversight Committee to explain itself. Um, rather, commentators interpreted these hikes as being the company's attempts to extract all the value it possibly could um, from its patent on this product in the waning days of the patent. Um, and the CEO of Mylan, Heather Bresch, really drew widespread scorn from the public for her testimony before Congress, in which she defended the price hikes but offered no re rationale for it. Now, I kind of shared in that sense of moral outrage, so I was receptive when my allergist said, hey, there's actually a competing product on the market now that you should consider. AviQ, which is made by Kaleo, is an even smaller auto-injector. It delivers its dose in five seconds instead of 10 seconds, and it has a little audio track that talks you through the injection. And my allergist said, All right, my patients love it. Nine out of 10 of the patients who I've switched to this product have stuck with it. Um, and best of all, the manufacturer is offering a zero cost prescription program for patients. So I agreed to the product. Weeks later, at a, a conference on prescription drug pricing, I learned that the price of AviQ is $4,500. The no-cost program, it turns out, was limited to three refills. And there was more when I called my insurance company to find out what I would pay for this drug uh, after the coupon expired, and then also what the health plan would pay for the drug. Um, they didn't know. They referred me to our pharmacy benefit management company, our PBM. And three phone calls later, I finally learned um, that the discount you know, pharmaceutical companies often talk about the big discounts they give to health plans in defending these high list prices. The discount that my company had obtained was a whopping 2.35%. They were going to pay $2,394 for this prescription. And moreover, it wasn't covered for my son uh, unless he couldn't take the EpiPen for some medical reason. So I stood to pay an out-of-pocket cost of over $13,000 annually for the three packs my son would need compared to $150 for um, Mylan's product. Now, the tale of AviQ and the EpiPen, as I mentioned, really reveals a lot of the underlying pathologies in our prescription drug system. A company with market dominance due to a patent seeks to squeeze every last cent out of that monopoly. It hikes the product's price repeatedly, although this product is globally recognized as an essential medication. 
And although this company itself shouldered none of the financial risk of developing this product, the auto injector was developed by the Department of Defense to house a drug that's naturally produced by the body. This particular injector was then developed by another company that Mylan merely bought. And the company was undeterred by reports of the financial toxicity that these price hikes were causing for American families. When a public backlash ensued, a market opportunity was created, and along came a competitor. But instead of waging a price war, as economists would predict, this competitor enters at seven times the price of the market leader. Yet the challenger wins market share. And it wins it not because its product is superior, but because it comes up with a way to drive a wedge between consumers and their health plans, this patient coupon program, which takes patient skin out of the game by taking away their personal co-payment, their our contribution towards the cost of this product, it removes the patient's incentive to be a savvy shopper. And it wins market share with a program that will eventually expire and leave patients on the hook. Now at the point of the prescriber, the physician is unaware of the relative cost of these products. He thinks he's being helpful by recommending a medicine that's available at zero cost to the patient. He likely has no awareness of the respective cost of these two products to the patient over the long term or the cost of their health plan and probably hasn't stopped to think about the fact that when a health plan's cost rises because a patient goes on an expensive drug, that patient will pay over the long term. She will pay in the form of higher premiums. And on the patient's part, considerable proactivity and persistence is required to figure out how much this drug is going to cost them over the long term. It's not difficult, I think, to understand why this combination of circumstances has led us to where we are today with prescription drug prices. As the engineers like to say, every system is perfectly designed to get the result it gets. And what has this system gotten us? Well, here are a few fun facts. We now spend 17% of our national health care spend on prescription drugs, both outpatient and infused. One in four Americans reports that within the last year, they didn't fill a prescription or they skipped doses or reduced their dosage because of concerns about the cost of the drug. The typical cost for an episode of cancer care now approaches $66,000. The biopharmaceutical industry ranks number one by a large margin in the amount spent on lobbying. And among the top 25 drug companies in terms of market capitalization in 2015, the latest year for which data are available, their profit margin exceeded 20%. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, there are some distinctive problems that makes this mess especially hard to unravel and get us out of. I want to talk tonight about what some of those distinctive problems are. I can put them into three bins. Some moral or ethical problems, a great deal of factors having to do with the prescription drug market itself, and finally a couple of factors relating to the political economy of this issue. So let me take each of these in turn. First, the moral issues. One of the things that became very apparent when I worked with the National Academies Committee in producing our report on this issue in 2017 is that even among the experts in the room, there was not a consensus about how to deal with what we all recognize to be a very core trade-off in dealing with this issue, which is the trade-off between producing innovation and making those innovations affordable. We want to have more drugs available on the market, but in a free market system, uh, the money goes in, our, in research and development where the money is likely to be in terms of return on investment. And so there is widespread recognition that um, if we begin to tighten down on price, to reduce revenue to the pharmaceutical sector, there is a risk that they will respond by reducing investment in research and development. But there are two big points of disagreement. One is, how much would that reduction be? Nobody knows. Pharmaceutical companies howl about the high cost of producing a new drug, and indeed it is astronomical, by one estimate, $2.6 billion to bring a new molecule to market when you take into account the fact that about 9 out of 10 molecules fail. The cost of the winner, all, all things rolled in together, tops $2 billion. 
So it's not unreasonable for them to complain that there needs to be a considerable return on investment. On the other hand, this is an industry that spends more on marketing and promotion than it does on research and development. It spends more on stock repurchases and dividends than it does on research and development. So there's clearly a lot of loose money in the system. But pointing that out is not the same as saying if we were to tighten down on price, that money would be diverted into R&D. It's possible that it wouldn't. But we don't really know what the effect would be. We can't quantify it. The other problem is even if we could quantify it, we can't agree on what we're willing to trade off. There are Americans who would trade off having a five or six fewer new molecules on the market every year if more Americans had access to the ones that we already have approved. There are others who would not, who are hoping for miracles and who want every cent possible to go into research and development. And because we can't agree as a polity and haven't really even begun to reckon with this issue as a polity about where we want to put that balance between affordability and innovation, um, we're stuck in terms of figuring out the direction we want to head in. The second moral problem is um, how to grapple with the ethics of the pharmaceutical industry itself. It's become very fashionable to have moral outrage around this industry. And indeed, some of the most egregious instances of price hikes, I think we can all sort of characterize fairly confidently as being moral wrongs. But the modal problem in drug pricing today is not the pill that went from $13 to $750 overnight. It's a slow accretion of price. It's drugs that um, are launched at relatively high prices that bear some relationship to their value. And the feeling that we feel, or, or maybe should feel, is not so much, I'm outraged, but rather, I don't like this. I wish it were cheaper. But coming up with a really sound ethical argument as to why that's drug company's problem is actually diff more difficult than it sounds. If we feel that Americans need to be connected with drugs because they're an essential good that's required for survival, that's a compelling moral argument. But it's not necessarily a compelling argument that companies should have to pay for that, as opposed to the government. We haven't, after all, agreed that we should all even have a basic package of health insurance subsidized through tax dollars. Until we can, again, find this common moral ground, it's hard to get to a particular destination in policymaking because we haven't decided what that destination should look like. And then there's the final moral concern that arises from thinking about the global implications of things that we might do here to tighten down on price. And the problem is this. We pay more for drugs than virtually any other country in the world. And as a result, it's quite possible that that is the reason why other countries are able to pay less. In particular, why poorer countries are able to pay much, much less for their drugs. Um, it's plausible that if we were to start reducing what we pay, other countries might be forced to pay more. That's maybe not such an issue when we think about the Germans or the French. But it's a big issue when we think about countries in Africa and Latin America who now struggle with farm school bills, even at very low prices. So there's a sort of balloon squeeze effect in the global market, where if we, if we contract our part, there will be a bulge in other parts of the world. And um, that's another place where Americans haven't really reckoned with what we feel our obligations as a polity are. Do we need to take care of Americans first, as we hear very commonly in politics these days? Or do the global implications of our actions matter? So all of these sort of deep philosophical questions um, are intellectually interesting. And they're, and they're also one of the reasons why we are having trouble making progress on these issues. Layered onto that are a whole bunch of issues with the market for prescription drugs itself, starting with a lack of transparency. Um, and this really takes two main forms. One is a lack of information about the drug supply chain itself. What I learned is that this is an incredibly complicated ecosystem that starts with a manufacturer of a drug and then includes a whole bunch of middlemen on the way down to the prescriber and the consumer. There are wholesalers. There are these PBMs who purchase and, re and resell drugs to health plans. There are retail pharmacies. And then, of course, the doctor and the patient. Along the way in the supply chain, everybody's cutting a deal. Many of these deals are based on rebates and discounts, where a drug is sold at one price and then marked up and resold down the supply chain at a slightly or sometimes much higher price. The difficulty in trying to figure out what policy should do is nobody knows who's taking what rents out of this system, as economists would say. Who's taking the excess value in big chunks here? Everybody points the finger at somebody else in this supply chain. And our committee could not get actual data, evidence, about who's making the money here. 
Is it the middlemen, as the president likes to say? Is it the manufacturers, as patient advocacy groups and health plans say? Is it health plans who are, in fact, getting big discounts, but then not passing those discounts along to us, their subscribers? It's very hard to say. And this is important because what we're looking for is opportunities to reduce price that won't affect innovation. If we can find that in these middlemen in the, in the supply chain, that would be wonderful. But without more data, it's really hard to know where to target policy. The other transparency problem is the one I've already talked about, and that's the one at the point of prescribing, where physicians and patients are operating in the dark, largely, as to what the cost of particular drug choices are going to be. Historically, it's been very difficult to get information that is usable to physicians because there's not one price for a drug. What your, what your health plan pays depends on its bargaining power, and what you pay depends on who your insurer is and how generous your plan coverage is. So every patient has her own price. Notably, last year, a partnership was forged between some of the major vendors of electronic health record systems and um, a provider of information systems and CVS Caremark, the largest PBM, that is now pushing out patient-specific cost information at the point of prescribing. It's a wonderful development. I've yet to encounter a physician who uses this information. So the next step is to figure out how to make this user friendly enough and give physicians the right incentives to use it. But right now, most physicians fly in the dark and most patients do too. Then there are a host of incentives problems. And I'll give just a brief tour of some of these, but believe me, there are many others. Uh, patient coupons, I, I've talked about a little already. This, so these are the, the discount programs that relieve me of my cost sharing for a prescription, but my health plan is going to get charged full freight for that drug. The purpose and intent of these programs is to get patients onto expensive branded drugs where cheaper alternatives are available. And they're quite successful in doing so. They're illegal to use for Medicare patients, but for commercially insured patients, they're perfectly legal. And they create obvious incentives problems vis-a-vis -vis health plans and patients. Direct-to-consumer advertising, something we all love to hate. There's not one of us who hasn't seen these ads on television. The United States is virtually unique in the world in allowing these direct-to-consumer advertisements. Only New Zealand, among industrialized countries, uh, also legalizes them. And they're tremendously effective, again, in inducing patients to ask for these expensive branded medications. And physicians, we know, very often comply with those requests. There are another instance in which um, companies are creating uh, demand for expensive products in a situation in which patients have very little incentive to push back uh, or even to understand what it is that they're asking for. Insurance benefit design is an important contributor to the drug affordability problem. And this is something that often gets lost in debates that tend to be all just about high prices. But the affordability of your drugs is a function of two things, what your drugs cost and how much insurance coverage you have. And for many Americans, the problem is that they have no insurance or they have too little insurance for prescription drugs. Even patients who we think about as being relatively well insured still pay a lot for prescription drugs. For example, Medicare patients um, in Part B, the, the part of Medicare that delivers infused drugs, will pay 20% of the list price of the drug. Um, in Part D, even, the, the cost of cancer therapies, uh, the patient share will, will pretty routinely be a quarter to a third of the cost of those drugs. And there's no out-of-pocket cost on what Medicare patients pay for their drugs. So there are very significant gaps in uh, insurance for patients. There are also perversities in the way these benefits are designed. And, and one of the biggest ones is that um, has to do with the difference between the list price and the net price of a drug. So a drug manufacturer sets a price for their drug. We call that the sticker price or the list price. And then, as I mentioned, there are a series of rebates and discounts negotiated down the, the supply chain. So what the health plan ultimately pays for that drug is often quite a bit less. Now, when you go to the pharmacy and you have a 20% coinsurance payment to be made, you don't pay that based on the net price. You pay that based on the list price, even though that's a fictional price that nobody actually paid. And if you're in a high deductible health plan where you have to spend five or $6,000 before you get any health insurance coverage at all, you have to pay the entire list price of that drug even though if you had met your deductible for the year and your health plan was buying the drug, they'd pay a much lower price. This makes no sense. There are other instances in which the system of rebates and discounts create situations where there are two drugs competing, and one of them is cheaper for the patient and the other is cheaper for her health plan. 
For example, for hepatitis C, this is something that's been in the news as having really high cost drugs. Um, Harvoni is offered at a much higher list price than a competitor called Zepatir. But um, the health plans get deep, deep rebates for Harvoni. So a patient is going to pay out of pocket more than $2,000 more a year for Harvoni than Zepatir, but the plan will direct patients to Harvoni because it costs the plan less. Benefits should not be designed this way in ways that create a schism between health plans and their patients, but they are. Another well-known problem is fragmentation of payers. Americans, you, you, really, you know this from lived experience, we change health insurers all the time, every couple of years for some families. And the impact of this for prescription drugs has been to create an incentive problems when we have a situation where a new drug comes on the market that can actually cure a disease. Eliminating the need for long-term pharmacotherapy or other kinds of therapy, but that drug costs a lot now. The current health insurer has no incentive to cover that drug. And let's return to hepatitis C as an example of this. These miracle drugs will prevent the need for liver transplants down the line, but most people won't need their transplants until they're on Medicare. So a commercial insurer today would rather kick the can down the road than pay for the drug now that will cure this disease with an eight-week course. This is a financing problem. It could be solved with different financing arrangements among health plans. Um, but we haven't been able to lick even these very basic problems of, of cash flow and, and um, financing. Then there are problems with how reimbursement is arranged in the system. I've mentioned Part B before. This is, again, the part of Medicare that covers drugs that aren't taken orally, like chemotherapy infusions. We have long paid um, medical providers to dispense these drugs in clinics, office-based and hospital-based clinics, through an arrangement called buy and bill where we allow those providers to buy the drugs at wholesale price and then sell the drugs to the patient at retail price, what we call average sales price. And we pay them uh, the average sales price plus 6% plus an administration fee. And they keep the difference. Now, this creates an obvious incentive for oncologists to pick the cancer drug that has the biggest difference between the wholesale and retail cost the drug that's best for the patient. And empirical research shows oncologists respond exactly as you would predict them to. This is a problem that has already attracted attention as beginning to be solved. We're tightening down on this arrangement. But again, why should physicians receive incentives that point them in the direction of things that aren't best for patients? And then finally, let's talk about these PBMs, these middlemen who play the role of buying drugs for health plans and then reselling them so that health plans don't have to de deal with the complexities of negotiating these prices and formularies. They serve a valuable function, but they too are paid on the difference between what they buy these drugs for and what they resell them for, which creates, of course, the incentive to, to sell high. Some of them are also reimbursed based on the total volume of drug costs that their clients had for the year, which gives them an incentive to run up costs. There are many other ways that these arrangements could be arranged besides marketing this spread. Uh, they could be paid a fixed fee, for example, but that's a very uncommon arrangement in the market. So all kinds of incentives problems up and down this complex supply chain really contribute to a lot of strategic behavior in the system. Everybody trying to game the system to get out what they can to maximize their own revenue. And at the bottom of this chain is a relatively hapless prescriber and patient who pay the bill. Finally. There are some important political factors that are worth mentioning. We don't come to this problem or any public policy problem with a clean slate. We come with a legacy of constraints imposed by past political deals. And in this case, there are a couple that have really hamstrung on our, our ability to do very effective public policy measures. One is that um, political deals have prevented the Medicare program from making much use of information about comparative effectiveness of different therapies or cost effectiveness of different drugs. Um, when uh, the Medicare Modernization Act was passed in 2003, it was decided that Medicare would essentially cover any drug that a provider deemed to be medically necessary and reasonable. And um, what was reasonable was generally determined by reference to what the FDA had approved. Um, it was further decided that Medicare would not be using cost effectiveness as a criterion for excluding drugs, nor could it use comparative effectiveness research as a basis for policymaking. So 
Although Part D plans, the individual private plans that administer the Medicare prescription drug benefit can make use of cost effectiveness information, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are juggernaut buyer. The agency that shoulders almost 30% of all prescription drug costs in the United States is hamstrung from doing strong things to send a message that costly, low-value drugs are not going to be covered. The other way in which it's hamstrung, as you've probably heard, is that it's not allowed to directly negotiate prices with drug companies. Only the private plans can do that. And the private plans can aggregate their buying power by going through just two or three different PBMs. They're pretty powerful bargaining uh, uh, folks in the market. But CMS, for sure, would have more power if it could do it directly. It is not allowed to. Um, when the prescription drug benefit for Medicare was adopted in 2006, the pharmaceutical industry foresaw that it very well could lead to having one juggernaut purchaser um, at the bargaining table. And this was part of the, the political deal that was cut in order to win support for that benefit. So in exchange for the benefit, we got the devolution of bargaining power to a million points of light, all these private plans, and consequently, a great weakening in the ability of our largest payer to um, get the price that it deserves as the largest payer in the market. In addition to these political compromises, there's one other factor in play that I want to mention. And that is the, the current political atmosphere. Um, the intense media scrutiny of the sort of very bad apples among pharmaceutical companies, the Martin Shkreli's, for example, has created a policy frame in which price gouging is the problem that has to be solved here. And that's really only part of the story. Um, the, the system, as I've just explained, is, is really rife with very structural, deep-seated problems that only have partly to do with culpable, culpable behavior on the part of pharmaceutical companies. But because we've created this kind of atmosphere of scandal, we've created um, demands to do something now, something aggressive that will root out the bad actors rather than an, an atmosphere in which kind of cooler heads can prevail and really grapple with some of the complexities of the system and the deep pathologies. It's also created an atmosphere, as I mentioned, of finger pointing, where everybody who's being blamed for the problem points a finger at the other guy and says he's the one to blame. At the same time, there's a sense of, of hunkering down, of trying to submerge information that might surface evidence that really helps policymakers identify opportunities to, to bring greater value to the system. So instead of being part of the solution, many pharmaceutical companies today feel like they're under attack, and that they're under attack unfairly, because it's indeed just a few small bad actors out there that have caused the problem. Um, and politicians, for their part, have tended to paint the industry with a very broad brush, not appreciating the differences between large and small companies, companies that have more or less of a sense of public health mission, platform companies and innovator companies, there are important differences here. Um, so we just have a situation where uh, nobody really wants to talk constructively or produce evidence to solve a problem. Um, there's, everybody is instead trying to hold on uh, to their share of what they've got, in part by submerging information. So this atmosphere has been a very, very difficult one uh, to make policy in. So these are some of the reasons why this problem, I think, is distinctively difficult to solve. Notwithstanding these factors, um, the Academy Committee on which I serve did have some ideas. And I want to share um, some of those with you tonight. Um, this is our report. And this is Norm Augustine, who, along with former Senator Jeff Bigaman, was one of the co-chairs of our committee. Uh, Mr. Augustine is a former CEO of um, Lockheed Martin. And he's sitting next to some of the documents that we had to review in writing this report. Our overall conclusion was that while the biopharmaceutical industry has done an incredible job of producing innovation, it is failing in its obligations to deliver that innovation to Americans, to make it affordable. And we offered a series of conclusions and recommendations that we think might be helpful. Let me share at least a few of these with you tonight. Many of them have to do with promoting generic competition. Now, I was surprised to learn that over 90% of prescriptions in the US today are for generics already. We might say, well, there's actually very little room to go in that. Um, but what I, what I appreciate much more now than before I started this work is that just because something is generic doesn't mean that it's cheap. The problem is that for many drugs, there's only one generic 
drug on the market. And while we see some reductions in price when one generic competitor enters the market, we see an, a much bigger drop when there are two, and then three and four. Um, but that just hasn't happened for a lot of generic drugs, and it's even a bigger problem for biosimilars, for generics of, of biological products. There are a number of problems that contribute to this that our recommendations address. One of them um, is the so-called pay-for-delay agreements. This is where a branded drug maker has its patent challenged by a generic company. The Hatch-Waxman Act actually creates incentives for generic companies to challenge the validity of patents as a way to try to expedite the entry of generic products. Um, the branded company will often just pay the generic company to settle the case, thereby delaying its entry into the market. Now, you might think that sounds anti-competitive. Um, and the Supreme Court's answer is that it could be, but it isn't necessarily. It has declined to rule that these pay-for-delay agreements are per se violations of antitrust law, and instead has ruled that the FTC has to police them one agreement at a time. We think the FTC could do a much more aggressive job of this. We've actually seen some moves in that direction over the last year or so. But this seems like a clear area for addressing barriers to generic entry. Another anti-competitive practice in the market relates to mergers and acquisitions. It's often the case that a company that is fighting to maintain market dominance will just buy a company that's developing a competitive product. And these mergers and acquisitions can and are scrutinized by the Federal Trade Commission that can block them if they're deemed anti-competitive. But again, we think there could be much more vigorous policing, requiring, for example, a company to divest itself of a competing product before an acquisition goes through. Another product, a pro, a practice you may have heard of is patent evergreening. This is where you're a, you're a branded drug company, your product is about to go off patent, and your creative lawyers and scientists think about a way to get a new patent by making some marginal incremental change to the drug. Um, my favorite example of this is when um, Prilosec was about to go off patent, they patented a method of delivering the drug by crushing it and, deliver, and um, feeding it to somebody with applesauce. So you can get a patent on the product itself. You can get a patent on a patent on method of delivering it, on a different dosage, different route of administration. There are all kinds of ways to make these patents evergreen and to extend that period of exclusivity on the market. This is something that the United States Patent and Trademark Office could start to clamp down on um, by elevating its standards of patentability. In terms of thinking about getting um, patent or generic drug applications to market. Um, it, it's been recognized that there's been a problem of backlog at the FDA. They, I must say, have done a miraculous job of clearing this backlog. Um, the president's taken credit of this, for this. It actually has to do with the fact that um, shortly before he took office, there was a very large infusion of funds to the FDA to hire additional reviewers. Um, so they've done a tremendous job now of clearing that backlog. But thinking ahead to the pipeline, one idea would be when such backlogs occur, to start thinking more about reciprocal reliance agreements with regulators in other countries that we trust to do robust drug reviews. Instead of every country doing its own review de novo, um, we could think about reciprocal uh, approval arrangements. And then uh, we thought also of, of sort of other ways to speed the path to market for generic market entry. With biosimilars, this has been a particular problem. And I was heartened to see that recently the FDA has taken this problem very seriously, has now really created a pathway for generics of biological products to get to market in a way that they never have been before, but in part by reclassifying some drugs. So that's very heartening. And then finally, many states have passed laws um, called dispense as written laws, which say that unless a physician specifically writes the generic name of a medication, on a prescription and instead uses a shorthand of a branded drug, the branded drug is what gets dispensed. Most states have the opposite type of law, requiring generic substitution unless the physician specifically says, no, I want Lipitor, the branded Lipitor. Um, but there's, there's really very little justification for requiring dispenses written um, prescriptions, and so that was another recommendation that we had for the states. So all of these are things that could foster more competition in the market. The great thing about these ideas, and probably the reason why they've seen maybe more uptake than other parts of our report, is that there are they're ideas that Republicans and Democrats can both love, because they invigorate competition in the market. A, a set of ideas that has considerably less appeal um, to some uh, politically relates to strengthening the power of CMS as a purchaser. Um, 
the idea here is to take up the, the challenge that candidate Trump made um, to enable CMS to directly negotiate for the price of prescription drugs itself. Um, our committee actually went a step further, saying not only that CMS should negotiate for Medicare, but we should also roll in um, any state programs that want to participate, as well as Veterans Affairs, Health System, and other federal programs to make one big purchaser at the bargaining table. Now, in order for that purchasing uh, power to be effective, you have to give it not just authority to buy, but also some actual power. And that means that you have to give Medicare the power to exclude drugs. So this is probably the most controversial suggestion in the report. Uh, the second one here, that HHS be authorized to selectively exclude certain drugs. Um, we're thinking here of, of drugs where there is a cheaper competitor of similar therapeutic value. And interestingly enough, this was uh, something very similar to this was part of the recent White House proposals. I'll talk about it shortly. Then we have a variety of, of recommendations relating to um, allowing Medicaid programs more flexibility to determine their own formularies, that is, which drugs are going to be on which payment tier. And for further experience with so, uh, experimentation with so-called value-based payment. Uh, when we heard testimony in the committee, from different stakeholders, the one idea that everybody liked was value-based payment, the notion that we should pay manufacturers for a drug depending on the clinical value that the drug delivers. Now, I suspect everybody likes that idea because people have a different idea about what that means. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we felt like this idea wasn't ready for prime time, but it was ready for more um, experimentation and demonstration project, products. Uh, one of the challenges is it's often difficult to know what the value of a drug is going to be at the time it's approved, since all we have is clinical trial evidence. But the idea that we should pay more for drugs that deliver more value seems very sensible. We're mindful, though, that this means that we will pay more for some drugs. There are many cheap antibiotics today that deliver enormous value. So for, if we were to go in this direction, some drugs would cost us more, other drugs less. We then had a suite of, of uh, recommendations relating to transparency. And the leading one was to require um, parties at the ends of the supply chain to provide information about the prices that they pay for drugs as a means of ferreting out who has sort of what margins in the supply chain. Where are the opportunities um, to reduce what middlemen and others were paying? Um, and we felt that publicly reporting this information would be valuable, that we, but that we needed a kind of learned intermediary to figure out what to do with it. Um, and congressional committee seemed um, like an obvious candidate. HHS is another. So hopefully with this expanded transparency, it will become apparent how sizable these discounts and rebates are and whether they are really delivering value to patients. Finally, um, there was some concern about the role played by patient advocacy organizations. Many of these organizations do very good work advocating for patients with particular diseases. They're also very often funded by companies who make the drugs for those diseases. Um, and while that arrangement may have both benefits and drawbacks, greater transparency about those financial flows seems warranted. Some of our recommendations related not to drug prices, but again to the other side of the coin, which is insurance generosity. Medicare patients, even with relatively good insurance, are still tremendously burdened by prescription drug out-of-pocket costs. So imposing a cap on total annual spending seemed like a good idea to us. Moreover, we felt that we ought to modify the way cost sharing is calculated in the Part D program and possibly in other plans. Um, when, for example, we have evidence that putting a patient on a drug saves us all money and keeps us all healthier. For example, it's an infectious disease drug. Why is it that we charge people cost sharing for that drug? Cost sharing should reflect something about the value of the drug to the patient and to society. And there may be some drugs for which the appropriate amount of cost sharing is zero. We also advocate ending the practice of pegging cost sharing to list prices, fictional price that nobody actually pays, and instead pegging it to the net price of the drug. Some of our recommendations relate to fixing things that have gone sour in federal programs. Let me talk about a couple of them. One is the 340B program. Section 340B of the Public Health Service Act was intended to improve the access of low-income populations to prescription drugs by allowing providers that primarily serve those low-income populations to make money buying those drugs and giving them out themselves. 
they were able to get those drugs at the Medicaid price, which is the best price in the market, and plus get some additional rebates. So it's a very, very good price. The program did not require them to pass on those lower drug prices to their patients, again, because it was intended to generate revenue for community health centers, federally qualified health centers that were really hurting financially. But what has happened over time is this program has become wildly popular. Uh, the number of nonprofit hospitals in the program, including Stanford Hospital, which I assure you does not serve a predominantly low-income population, uh, now vastly outnumbers the, the number of, of healthcare providers that are primarily serving low-income populations. So a lot of, of new entities, primarily hospitals, have gotten into this program. They're getting these low prices, and there's no evidence that they're passing them along in any meaningful way. So it's an instance where a program is being gamed, and it has not escaped the scrutiny of Congress. In fact, in January 2018, House Energy and Commerce Committee has initiated a, a report recommending more oversight of the program. And indeed, we recommended that the least we could do is begin collecting some data on who's in this program and what they're doing with the money, which is not something that has been done historically. The second program I want to talk about is the, um, the Orphan Drug Program. In 1983, Congress passed the Orphan Drug Act to stimulate um, research and development on rare diseases. And the reasons for needing to do this should be obvious when you've got a disease that has less than 200,000 people in the US population that have it, you're not going to make very much money off of those drugs, at least not unless they're very high priced. Um, so it's to incentivize development uh, of those drugs, uh, drug companies were offered a suite of very valuable benefits, um, the, the jewel of which was an additional seven years of market exclusivity for that drug. This uh, act has been enormously successful in achieving its purpose of stimulating investment in these kinds of drugs. It has also been gained. Some of the things we learned is that many drugs have multiple orphan drug designations. For example, the breakthrough cancer drug Gleevec has nine seven-year patent extensions. Some drugs have been given orphan status after they were already blockbuster drugs. So they were a blockbuster drug that a company then got approved for an orphan drug indication as well. Biox, Cialis, Botox, all of these are orphan drugs that have been granted this, these special benefits, including a much longer patent period. And some drugs had already uh, been approved for general use and were then given an a orphan drug indication for some disease subcategory. So these are all situations where a program with the best of intentions and, and quite a good effect has simply been gamed through the strategic behavior, and there's an opportunity to ratchet it back. And indeed, the FDA this year has signaled interest in doing this. But these are some of the specific ideas that the committee had. A number of our recommendations were, were aimed at getting better information to prescribers at the point of prescribing, and also changing the way that prescribers are reimbursed. I've talked about the problems here already with buy and bill in Medicare Part B. Um, other practices, for example, were that uh, a drug that could be administered in an outpatient setting could be administered instead at a hospital, and the hospital would get paid a lot more for it, even though it could be administered in a much cheaper setting. So these types of reimbursement practices, as I mentioned, just create the wrong incentives, and there's really no reason for them. Both of those things, the site neutral payment and the buy and bill arrangements, have been targeted already uh, for, to be fixed uh, just within the last year. Um, pharmaceutical detailing is another thing that the, co the committee considered in some detail. This is where our sales representatives visit doctors and, and uh, give them a sales pitch about their product. Um, a lot of academic medical centers have started to ban those visits and have found dramatic reductions in the uh, extent of prescribing of the expensive brand of drugs. And the committee recommends that those restrictions become more widespread. And then finally, we recommend more widespread adoption of these information systems that bring price information to the point of prescribing. Direct-to-consumer advertising consumed a considerable amount of the committee's time. The difficulty here is the pesky First Amendment, which prohibits us from banning um, advertisement because it falls into the category of protected commercial speech. However unwise we might think the practice to be, as a policy matter, it's here to stay. What we can do, however, is at least eliminate its financial attractiveness by making it no longer deductible as a business expense. 
Uh, last year, the pharmaceutical industry, our industry spent $5.2 billion on direct-to-consumer advertisements, and it was all, uh, it was all uh, eligible for a write-off as a business expense. And we also thought there was a prospect of encouraging companies to work together to adopt codes of conduct that would begin to curb DTCA. There was some indication that um, companies would actually rather not be doing as much of this as they are, but there's a sort of arms race going on with consumer advertising where they feel they have to because their competitors are doing it. Um, so that seemed worthy of exploration, although I must say the return on investment in these advertisements is, is pretty high. And then finally, there was a feeling that these patient coupon programs should not be permitted to exist, except in situations where there's just one drug on the market for that treatment. In that case, we want the patient to get the access to the drug. There's no cheaper alternative that they're being diverted away from with these, uh, the lure of the coupons. But otherwise, the rules that apply to Medicare, that seems sensible to extend to other programs. There are a number of things we didn't recommend. Let me talk about some of the most important. The ban on DTCA I've already mentioned, not that it's unwise, but that it's illegal. Um, drug reimportation is something that has been a sort of hearty perennial in policy circles for years, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, the idea here is if, well, you know, if Canada's buying this drug cheaper than the US, why don't we just reimport it from Canada? Um, there's something to be said for that, but when we looked into this, it seemed uh, that the difficulty was the countries that we would trust to have a safe drug supply just don't buy enough of the drug that we could reimport enough of it. In order to get our supply big enough, we'd have to start reaching into lesser developed countries that don't have robust regulatory and drug safety systems. And then the FDA's longstanding concerns about um, allowing drugs that might be counterfeit or otherwise contaminated or unsafe really do seem to pop up. So it didn't actually seem to be a place where we could save a lot of money at the end of the day if we wanted to maintain a safe supply. Direct price controls um, are an obvious option. Why not simply just regulate the prices of drugs as many other countries do? It's, it's a key strategy in, in most European countries. Um, the feeling was that this would simply be too risky in terms of the effect on innovation. And the same goes for exercising so-called march-in rights. The government has a right to march into somebody's patent and seize that patent right. But again, uh, the feeling among at least some on our committee was that this would be so tremendously disruptive to the market that it wasn't safe to pursue from a perspective of maintaining a stable uh, level of investment in R&D. So let me conclude with just a couple of ruminations on what's going on in Washington and in the states right now. And I'd be happy to take some questions. As I've been mentioning, a lot of these recommendations have, have received attention. There's been traction on them. Um, in the states, there has been a move towards adopting laws that require companies to justify price hikes. These transparency or price gouging laws um, typically report, require companies to report when a price hike is going to uh, exceed a certain level and then make a showing as to why uh, they're going to uh, do that. Um, Congress last year banned so-called gag clauses, which unbelievably there were contracts that actually prohibited a pharmacist from telling a patient that because of these rebates and discounts, she can actually get the drug cheaper by paying cash than going through her health plan. It's no longer uh, legal to silence pharmacists on that issue. Two bills that were just introduced um, in the last month in the Congress, one um, would actually enable the Department of Health and Human Services to block, uh, using the power of the Attorney General, price increases that exceed a certain uh, level over one, two, or three years um, by uh, requiring the company to disgorge that money back to consumers and health plans, and also by levying civil fines. Um, that was a bill introduced by four Democrats, and it's unclear whether it will get any traction. Um, another bill recently introduced would allow the government to get into the business of making drugs. Um, that for certain generics where there's insufficient competition, the government could simply make and sell those drugs. And there's been a lot going on at the FDA. Uh, the commissioner has been very avid in pursuing measures that would promote generic competition, including this new biosimilars pathway and has begun, as I said, to tighten down on what, uh, what drugs can get an orphan drug designation. The big action, though, and all the attention has been in the White House blueprint for drug pricing since this was a centerpiece of the president's uh, campaign trail. Um, let me just go through some of these, this complicated set of ideas. Um, the one that's gotten the most airplay recently is the idea that we should set our prices in Medicare Part B based on what other countries are paying. Right now, they set their prices as a percentage of what we pay. So this is sort of flipping that reference pricing on its head. Um, there's also efforts to encourage more price negotiation in Medicare Part B. 
and um, a sort of surprising recommendation, quite a bold one, to allow Part D, uh, the CMS, not individual plans, but CMS to exclude certain drugs that are in um, protected classes. The law establishes six protected classes, including cancer drugs, where Medicare has to cover basically all drugs. Um, it would walk that back and say you have to cover at least two drugs in these classes, but you don't have to, to cover them all. Um, hitting some other highlights here, another one that's gotten a lot of attention is the notion that consumer advertisements should convey the price of the drug among the small print at the end of the advertisement as a way of informing consumers. Um, the difficulty here is which price should be there, since the list price is the only one that is standard, but not what anybody pays. Um, other ideas are to require PBMs to pass on their discounts instead of um, retaining them as profit, uh, to get rid of cost sharing for generic drugs for Medicare patients in Part D who are low income, and to finally plug the donut hole. This is this gap in Medicare Part D coverage. You sort of spend, spend, and then you get into a chasm where you have very high out-of-pocket costs. Uh, the, there's been a proposal circulating really for years to kind of to bridge that gap, and that's part of the White House plan as well. So there's a lot of interesting ideas in this plan. Some are dogs, some really have promise. Uh, but um, there seems to be a sincere effort on the part of the agencies to begin thinking about what powers they might be able to exercise to begin to, to bridge some of these gaps. What's missing here, though, are some of the bolder ideas. You don't see anyone any longer proposing that CMS directly negotiate prices for Medicare. That went out the window when Alex Azar took the helm at HHS. Um, and we don't see a lot of other really trenchant um, uh, deep cutting ideas that the influence of the pharmaceutical industry is sort of being weighed against um, the need for boldness here. Uh, and, and we will see what comes out, but um, there's a lot of effort to make some action here. What remains to be seen is exactly what the right prescription will be, um, and I don't envy anyone that task. Again, as I say, I think this is the hardest problem in health policy. So I'm very happy now to take questions. <laughs>